If we just take a little bit, uh, a little look into the future, yeah. um, do you see any, first of all, like any upcoming producers, producers in Champagne? Or, and a question I'm really interested in: Are there any like vintage that is coming up that you like really looking forward to? Yeah, um, th there are so many names now. Yeah. So what I really see when I receive all these wines coming home, some producers are, they are never good. And I, I taste it, not so interested. And wow, what a dramatic change. This guy, ah, it's, it's the son who's taking over. Th those kind of things are happening all the time. So I, I wouldn't like to mention names, but I will say for sure, if you're, if you're investing in champagne and if you're interested in drinking them both on both sides, you should look for this, the best champagne that each small producer is doing. His or her single vineyard champagne from what they believe is the best one. 95% of the time they are correct. It, it's the best wine they, they make. There are reasons for that. There's all the oldest vines. They put some more labor of love in, into it and, and they obtain something which is very interesting and uh, gorgeous to taste la later on as well. So there are many, many names. My book, Champagne Magnum Opus, is showing them right now. Those are the best ones right now. You start to look at the three, four, and five star producers. That, that's where you should go. Uh, but next year, there might pop up three, four <laughs> new ones, which I have not tasted yet, and they're, they're coming out. When it comes to vintages, uh, um, we're tasting the eight. Everybody knows that eight is uh, gorgeous. I say I don't drink my eights at all because they are not ready. They're in a, uh, in many especially growers are in a strange phase sometimes and I prefer some other vintages which are more in balance right now. Mm -hmm. So they are, um, a good example is 12 is much more harmonic to taste. Most of the time it's more drinkable than the eights today. The 12s are not, uh, I, I see today that they are not gaining in quality that much. It will not be the, the one that I put down in my cellar in the same amount. Uh, and um, I can mention every year and say yeah. wh what it is. But the big one is 18. 18 is tremendously good. And a great combination between fresh, early maturing uh, fruit and at the same time edgeability. So it, it's a, to put it simple, it's a great vintage. That's perfect vintage. because this is a question I get like pretty much all the time, yeah. and I, now I know 18, 18 is the one. 18. Perfect. But uh, with the top scores you have on your list, uh, it's not hard to imagine where you had your best champagne experience. You already told a little bit earlier here today, but if you can just give some advice to our viewers, um, like some advice along the way, how, what can they do to get this? the best possible champagne experience. Is there any like, yeah, small yeah. trick? Yes, it, it's a very simple trick. <laughs> it, it's to take the bottle and uh, travel to Patagonia and go out at um, Torres del Paine and sit down, check the right weather and drink a bottle a day for a week and you will do it. Uh, a, a joke, but it's not the easiest thing to do. But why I mentioned that, it's because I, you know, I. I created this concept champagne hiking and it took me many years I've been doing this but I didn't uh, make it a concept until quite recently and a book three years ago um, and, and the, the background for that is that we're sitting in a very classic place for food and wine this is a started with a cheese and wine combination today it's more a food and wine combination place Vinyas Ostern Vincellar and uh, that part was the second part after just drinking wine and speaking about quality of wine. Next step, when people understood, okay, we can enhance the wine experience by not just adding that. We should also look at the tool, glasses, shapes of glasses. It, it's been around all the time, but so many mistakes has been done. But suddenly, thanks to Riedel from the start, start to get focus on that and you saw that the same wine could taste quite rather differently and in different 
with the different tools, different classes. So the, the wine itself, the, the combination with the food, the tool, yes, there you, you have most of the things which are very important. One thing more for me was very important and no one really wrote about it. It's the place, the occasion, and the partner, the company, the people who you, you're drinking it with. To write a book about this is the way your company should be, that's, that's rather tough. That's <laughs> tough. <laughs> Say, don't drink with red-haired exactly. girls. That's it, it does work. You can't do those kind of things. So of course, um, for me, it was simple. It actually started with some experiments. When, when I was traveling, I vacation, you feel better. You're longing for a bottle of great wine. I was always longing for great champagne when I was traveling. So I started to bring champagnes that I thought would be suitable for the place where we mm. went. And I've been drinking on vacation for so many years, and I've been so disappointed with different styles that doesn't work in the sun or by the beach or whatever. And, but I also, very early on, when we were driving through Champagne, especially two, I started in 86, as I said, and in 88, we were traveling with the car, buying Champagne, going down to Switzerland and to some other, in Italy and some other parts in France, and we brought bottles. We went up with ice buckets. We were strong guys at the time. So we walked up <laughs> quite far away, a couple of hundred meters in uh, the Alps, where it still was green and overlooking Alp lakes and things like that. We found a spot in the shade because we felt that uh, the direct sun rays in the summertime is harmful for the wine. And we were enjoying the moment. We were taking it very slow. Sometimes we were eating, sometimes without. We were discussing the wine. We were looking at the birds flying past. We were checking the, the clouds. We were in the moment and we were in the perfect spot with the perfect air and uh, beautiful view, etc. So I've been doing that for a couple of times, for many, many times, <laughs> a couple of years, I will say. And so I felt that you could. What I'm doing so much when I rate my champagnes in my books and in Champagne Club in my tasting library is that I, I want to exclude the things that um, might affect if the wine are good or not. Because I, when I was reading a lot of books in the beginning, I saw that some of the authors were, oh, we had such a good time, we're sitting in this beautiful room, etc. Et and I, I can't judge wines by how beautiful the people are who are serving it, etc. So I want to skip that uh, when I always do that. I put myself in a mental room as part of my blind tasting skills. It, it is to go naked with the wine just to see what, what's the problem in the air. Um, how do I feel myself before I put the score? So I, I, I mental bubble to be neutral, to obtain the, the quality, to find the, the, the quality. But with champagne hiking, I did absolutely the other way around. I, I'm human, I'm very emotional, so of course I go very much excited by enhancing the experience by the right company, by the right, right uh, preparations, by the right glasses, by the right place, etc. So what I did was that I traveled around the globe, picked 100 of the best places. We say it's the 100 best champagnes at the 100 best locations in the world to, to drink it. And the example I mentioned was a Boulanger Vieux Vin Francais in the National Park of Chile in uh, Patagonia, which was probably the most memorable. It, it was one of the perfect spots where everything just... I could copy that one. Yeah. <laughs> so do, do that. That's, yeah. that's the <laughs> uh, and now we're, we're talking a lot about champagne, obviously. You're yeah. here. Uh, but fortunately, there is some other amazing wines out there. Uh, and if you do not drink champagne, what kind of wine do you prefer? I just drink milk. <laughs> <laughs> like a typical Sweden. No, no. Uh, uh, no it, it's true because I, I have, um, first of all, I'm not a heavy drinker. I'm a heavy taster. But I, I, and I, I would love to drink all, all the time. But the body can't take it. Yeah. So, and I'm coming from the sports world and I, I'm, I'm far too into to have this 
right kind of emotions we, we discussed before this interview. You said when you enter a place, you start by running after the flight and things like that. I, I do the same to be um, uh, in good health before I, I drink something. So I'm very selective when I drink. Uh, and then it's most of the time when I drink, it's great champagnes because I have this amazing amount of champagnes that I need to taste. Of course, the ones I drink are on the very, very high scale. And the other thing is I rarely open bottles at home because I have so many occasions where I can drink wine of the highest level. So it's among friends, it's on events, or it's at Guide Michelin star restaurants. So what do I bring? It's, I'm very French. Um, I would say when I should drink a little bit slower, mm -hmm. I, I sometimes skip the champagne, I go for a white burgundy because I, I can drink for a longer time. I don't need, if I drink champagne and it's good, it it's just disappears and you need to bring a new bottle. <laughs> but I, I can stay longer with the Coton Charlemagne or uh, um, uh, Puligny Montrachet, Premier Cru, something like that for a longer time. So that happens. And can I just ask you that, white burgundy, yeah. isn't it like champagne without bubbles? It, very much so, but it's uh, not as easy to drink much, which is uh, an advantage when you're in the Guide Michelin uh, rest yeah, restaurant yeah. <laughs> and you have 14 courses to go through. The, I can stay there more. Uh, my biggest, my, I have another 100 point wine because I, I taste, of course, a lot of other wines from the rest of the world. And it is the 1985 Romane Conti in Jeroboam, which is my only, my only red wine, uh, 100 point, or other wine, because I have a few 99 points, some white. And, uh, so I would say red Burgundy, DRC, um, it's, I mean, it, it's so obvious to say that. And um, I've been tasting, I've been very fortunate enough, so I've been tasting a lot of Latash and Richbourg, etc. Not so many Romane Contis in comparison. It's not that many people that actually tried so many Romane Contis. No, no, it's so. true. I, six or seven vintages or something like that. But anyway, each time I have been preferring Latash, mm -hmm. except this time. When I had all three in Jerboams, I started with a Richbourg 85 Jero, and I felt this is close to 100 points. This might be the best red wine I ever tasted. And then I took the second glass, it was Latash, and it was slightly better. <laughs> and I felt, I'm in heaven now. I took the Romani Conti, and it was one point more. So that's 100. That's where wow. we are. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. I could actually have your life now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, enough with all the talk now, because the two of us is actually going to move uh, Move on, we're having a nice event with some of our investors. So uh, let's go and... And a nice dinner. And a nice dinner as well. So many Conti is popping up, or let's the 28th? Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> let's see. Thanks so much. Thank Cheers. 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 Cheers.